Oh, shit. Aha. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Good. All right. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, it's really um, it's really a pleasure to meet everyone in two dimensions on this on this lovely Saturday, right? It is, after all, Saturday, so let's keep this informal as and as informal as possible. Uh, I know, Stephen, you said let's keep all the questions, uh, you know, till the end. But if I may, I will, uh, you know, I will revolt against this uh, draconian rule and i will uh, i will say if anything doesn't make sense along the way please just feel free to to interrupt me and, or if you spot spot an error you know if you spot a sign error in one of the equations you're like wait that should be you know a minus <laughs> ken ken is most likely to do that yeah so Ken, right? Please yeah. pay attention, right? I, I'm a positive person. I only do pluses. I don't do minuses, <laughs> and uh, this means only only fifty percent of my results are wrong. So why don't I um, go ahead and share screen here, and I'll uh, <clears throat> go through, show you guys a couple slides on on where we are. So of course, you know, it's, uh, Planet Nine is what we will talk about uh predominantly but to set the stage it's always important to recall that the whole you know the whole story uh of of this planet nine business really begins in a real way um more than i guess at this point more than 30 years ago right with the discovery of you know the first kind of Kuiper belt object other than pluto right so here we're looking at the solar system uh top down we got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. My house is actually right there. You can really, if you zoom in, you can see it. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and in blue, this the tilted orbit is the orbit of Pluto. A Pluto, of course, was mistaken originally for a for a legitimate planet uh, back in 1930. But uh, as it turns out, Pluto is pretty tiny. And in 1992, right, the first Kuiper Belt object, some piece of ice floating beyond. Uh, Neptune was discovered and everybody who was paying attention realized that this is not just, you know, a random icy asteroid, this is the beginning of the unveiling of a whole field of icy debris, a whole sort of second asteroid belt, if you will, uh, of the solar system that lives beyond the orbit of Neptune. So today we know of, I don't know exactly how many of these Kuiper Belt objects, but it's the tally is well in the thousands. I think it's not quite at the 10,000 level yet, but, but it's close. And what is remarkable about the Kuiper Belt, <laughs> kind of beyond the fact that it exists, is the dynamical structure that it has, and that is its, its orbital architecture. If you look at kind of what this simple diagram is showing you, it's showing you that all of the orbits tend to hug the orbit of Neptune, right? They all kind of at closest approach, at perihelion, right, tend to you know, be tethered to Neptune. Why is that? So the first Kind of thing that the Kuiper Belt has caused, the, the discovery and characterization of Kuiper Belt has posed is this question of how do you A, get it there, and how do you reproduce this structure uh, where, where the Kuiper Belt is dynamically excited? So uh, this remarkably has, has caused, has sort of driven a complete retelling, um, a reimagination of the solar system's early evolution. Um, it used to be that planet formation theory circa, you know, 1995 was that you know where Jupiter is and that's where it formed. You know where Saturn is and that's where it formed. You know where Uranus is and that's where it formed. And you would kind of tell a story about how that happened. With the discovery of the Kuiper Belt, it became clear that you could no longer get away with just, uh, with a static view of of solar system formation. Instead, right, the whole 
theory had to change. And the final answer that emerged is a remarkable one. Basically, what we now know is that the solar system started out in a much more compact configuration. And this is not just a movie, this is a simulation outcome from a, one of our models from about 10 years ago. So you have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune starting out in a more compact uh, orbital state, also encircled by a field of debris of totaling about 20 Earth masses between roughly 15 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun and Neptune's present day orbit. And the by interacting with these debris and scattering them around, the planetary orbits expanded. Um, and um, <clears throat> it turns out this type of these types of simulations, these types of models are very successful at the end of the day in reproducing both the structure of the Kuiper belt as well as a whole bunch of other things like the existence of Jupiter Trojan asteroids, Neptune Trojan asteroids. There's all kinds of stuff about the solar system that suddenly fits into place if you adopt this dynamical instability as something that indeed happened. So this was quite a quite a big um, you know turn in terms of how people used to think about planet formation. But at this point, I think most everyone agrees that um, you know, planet from the solar system really underwent this static, uh, this dynamic uh, period. So th that story, I would say, completed around 2012, right? By about 2012, most of the problems associated with the structure of the Kuiper belt and the kind of early dynamical evolution of the solar system were kind of worked out. And, uh, you know, for a while, it was kind of this celebratory couple of years where everyone, you know, shook hands and agreed that we all had collectively figured out the early evolution of the solar system. Sure, there are details to be worked out, but the basic picture is fine. We understand the Kuiper belt. There's not really much else to be discovered. And, and that was kind of uh, 2013, 2014. I remember these, uh, these talks about uh, about how, how everything is peachy. But, uh, you know, it didn't take too many years for us to, to realize that something else is going on. And inspired by work from um, other astronomers, Chatter Chatterjee and Scott Shepard, what Mike, Mike Brown, who's, a, who's my partner in crime in all of this, and I realized back in 2015, 2016, is that if you zoom out, okay, and look at the most distant orbits that exist in the Kuiper Belt, there's something weird, right? They are all, first of all, they all fall into the same plane, right? As we rotated this picture around, right? You could probably see how all the orbits have a common tilt by about 20 degrees. And also these same orbits all point in the same direction. So we thought this was pretty weird. And, uh, you know, kind of asked ourselves, is this a big deal? Now, since then, the tally of these distant Kuiper Belt objects has more than doubled. In fact, it has almost tripled. And the pattern has become even more interesting. As it turns out, right, it's not simply that these objects all point into the same directions. There is a dependence of this clustering on dynamical stability. Let me take a moment to explain this in a little bit more detail. Right, The distant part of the Kuiper Belt Kind of these the so-called scattered disk population are orbits that are all look kind of like this they're very elongated they're long and skinny and at closest approach most of them hug the orbit of neptune like i was saying now neptune has pretty strong gravity so what neptune does is every time they meet in conjunction neptune will gravitationally kick these orbits and the orbits change a little bit okay and so uh, if you kind of make a long-term movie of this and watch it in uh, fast forward, what you will note is that the solar system is always leaking Kuiper Belt objects out to interstellar space. Okay, they, they're, These orbits get perturbed, 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 and eventually just get kicked out of the solar system altogether. Okay, So a fraction of them don't. And it took us some time to really develop the theory for um, for what separates the stable versus the unstable orbits, but we've we've um, 
I think, done a pretty good job on that end. And you can sort of see on this simple diagram that the stable orbits cluster together, okay? Right, they're all yeah. kind of pointing down towards the bottom of the slide, whereas the unstable kind of green orbits are more or less isotropically distributed. This is even more weird than just having orbital clustering. It's, it's orbital clustering, which seems to care a lot on whether or not you are strongly tethered to Neptune. And if you are not gravitationally talking to Neptune, then you exhibit statistically significant orbital cluster. Okay, so um, that's, that's the story. And that's the data set right now. Okay, so what's going on, right? Typically, whenever you find something weird in astrophysics, the, the first urge that everybody has is to attribute this to something that happened a really, really long time ago, right? Like, you know, the Big Bang is a pretty good uh, example of this, where you put all of the interesting physics within the first, you know, half a second of the universe's lifetime. And you say, okay, everything since then, we've just been slowly expanding, right? So in planetary astrophysics, the urge is always the same. So you might say, okay, if we have some clustering together, that must mean that something bad happened to the solar system four and a half billion years ago when it was forming. Maybe it was a passing star. Maybe we just flew through some giant molecular cloud, like just something. And then you kind of say, could that, could we be looking at some relic of, of a process that is long gone? And the answer here is a definitive no. And the reason the answer is definitively no is that if you were to take this orbital state that we're observing right now and allow it to evolve okay, over four and a half billion years, even these stable orbits will slowly process out of alignment on a time scale of a few hundreds of millions of years, which is short compared to the lifetime of the solar system. So just immediately by looking at this, you know that not only is there clustering among the dynamically stable objects, it's being maintained in real time by some distant gravitational torque, okay? That you, you cannot just say this is some past event, something is holding it together right now. So- Constantine, can I, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Since, since you've invited us to- uh, Absolutely. To yeah. inter interrupt in here. Uh, I, I ran, ran into a, um, an article somewhere. There was, there was some criticism Mm -hmm. And they use the term uh, selection bias. Excellent question, Stephen. Yeah. Is All right. It, so is that let's related pick, to this. Yeah, that's absolutely related to this. So let's pick up on this in about uh, two slides. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, because we will we'll get there. That it's a uh, it, there is a uh, indeed when it comes to all things Planet Nine, right. When, it, when like you have some uh, scientific article, but then it's, its message gets sort of amplified, you know, a thousand fold uh, up or down when it gets covered in the media. And this, by the way, happens whether it's the positive or negative news, right? Whenever we write something about Planet Nine, it's like, oh my God, we're about to find it. You know, in, in a few moments, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see the object. And, you know, when somebody says, well, we did a statistical calculation selection bias, it's like, oh my God, it doesn't exist. So we'll get there in just a second. I'm glad you brought this up, but let's for, for a second, just like look at the data and take it at face value, right? Let's imagine that what we see is really what's going on in the outer solar system. What do you have? Well, you need some kind of gravitational torque to keep the orbits confined. And long story short, if you do the math, it turns out that the kind of object that you need, the kind of source of gravity that you need is something with a few Earth masses, like five Earth masses or six Earth masses, so it turns out to be uh, the best fit to the data. So. What I'm showing you here is again, an output of uh, the simulation uh, of a, one of the simulations that we've done where um, you're evolving the solar system, the distant solar system over its entire four and a half billion year lifetime under the gravity of the giant planets, which are these tiny uh, pink circles in the center. 
here, as well as an additional object which or which orbits the sun, and we do many trials of the of the orbital parameters. This is just one example, but here this object is actually um, has an orbital period of about uh, sixteen thousand years and uh, and an orbital eccentricity of about zero point six. And what you get to see in time is that as the orbits kind of evolve and dance around in their in their usual chaotic way, about you know two and a half three billion years into the lifetime of the sun, which we're about reaching now, you get to see a pattern of clustering that is getting carved out. It took us a while to understand how this actually happened, right? But the way this happens is that when orbits align with the orbit of, of this distant perturber, right, their eccentricity, their ellipticity goes through a maximum, and then their their orbits kind of get jammed into Neptune and then Neptune ejects them. So this net process very naturally carves out a population of bodies uh, who that are clustered together and that are stable, okay, that are not strongly interacting with Neptune. So the, the existence of a gravitational perturbation that's coming from uh, some further distant orbit is required to not only cluster the orbits, but to also instill this pattern of uh, clustering only among the stable objects. Okay. And we'll come back to a few slides down, we'll come back to these weird things that look like they're coming out of the solar system where they shouldn't be. Like you guys all see this weird orbit that's like pointing up. Uh, that it turns out there's a whole story that unravels once you once you pull on this string. But before we do, right, um, I want to revisit the question that Stephen just asked, because, OK, you can look at the data. You can say, all right, the data can be explained by some gravitational pull, right, that's coming from further out. We can compute the orbit and the mass of such a gravitational pull, the mass being sort of in a few Earth mass regime, uh, the most natural thing to, the most kind of natural place to go is say, what, what physical bodies come in that mass range of planets? In fact, turns out five and six Earth mass planets are the most common outcome of planet formation in the galaxy. Generally, that's what ex, uh, surveys for extrasolar planets have told us, but you of course have to then ask the question, have we built this entire story uh, on shaky foundation, right? What about observational bias? And this fundamentally is very simple, okay? Suppose, right, I have a monopoly over the Palomar telescope, right? And I don't let anybody else use it and only I get to decide where we point it, okay? And I decide that you know, over here is my favorite portion of the sky, and we're only going to look for uh, anything over here, where right? we'll never change uh, pointing. Then, naturally, I'm only going to find objects that are visible in this part of the sky. And because these orbits are long and skinny, the part where the objects are most visible are where they're closest to the sun. So you kind of naturally can, that, in that manner, carve out um, carve out the uh, an, an observational uh, a pattern of clustering that is not real that is entirely governed by where you've looked does that make sense right that's a perfectly plausible thing to, to now if you look at the internet if you look at twitter.com the verdict is in right when this when somebody uh kind of wrote about this in the news it was just like planet nine is dead uh, blah, 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 the long story short, any evidence for planet nine is gone. Don't let Avi Loeb drama overshadow the fact that planet nine evidence has died this week. There's also other interesting th things I found by looking on Twitter, uh, like the planet nine postdoctoral researcher screamed, the woke are getting more woke. Okay, which, you know, is... is, uh, is <laughs> <laughs> it's about it's about you know on uh, on par with the rest of the messaging so 
what's going on why is this why did this news uh suddenly break back in <clears throat> i guess it was january or february of uh, not this year but last year it was because a group uh, out of university of michigan said okay we don't know the pointing history of every survey okay so let's let's forget about objects discovered most of the objects of the uh, of the uh the sample we will only focus on basically two surveys where we do know where things pointed one of these surveys is the so-called des survey which has a pointing history of this thing that looks like a tank on the night sky right and basically they said okay look at where this tank intersects the um uh, ecliptic plane which is the um which is the red line on the night sky it only intersects it in a narrow band this means that everything that the ecliptic plane this des survey can discover is going to naturally be biased okay and they're right the des sir the des objects do not really add anything to the story because they are extraordinarily biased where where this story goes wrong is then to assume that everybody else is just as biased as as they are and here's the kicker the des survey was not designed to look for kuiper belt objects at all it was designed to look for you know supernovae and and all kinds of other random stuff the kuiper belt object search was kind of a reanalysis of of the data so this approach of trying to kind of simulate the selection biases uh will always you know with given a small enough number of of kbo's give you the answer of you can't tell you can't tell if things are really clustered together or if you uh have created a clustering by only looking at one uh part portion of the sky so if this approach is statistically not giving you an answer you can either give up or you can think of a different approach and thankfully, there exists a different approach. And the different approach takes advantage of the following, right? When I was showing you guys the slide with a bunch of orbits on, right? There was about 18, there were about 18 orbits, right? The kind of crew that talks about selection bias looks at these 18, uh, really looks at seven of these objects because they say everything else you know, is not well enough characterized. They look at these seven objects in isolation and try to do statistics with them. But it's important to not forget that the Kuiper belt is not seven objects. Okay, the Kuiper belt is thousands of objects. And in fact, the whole history of discoveries on the night sky tells you where people have looked. Okay, you see, if we discovered the Kuiper belt, and all of the objects were in one portion of the sky, you would say, well, sure, that's, that must mean that they were all discovered by a single survey that only looked over there. But in fact, if you look at the kind of footprint of where things have been discovered, it's very uniform across the night sky. So you can do a different calculation. You can say, given this footprint of where everybody else has looked, you can construct a kind of map, uh, a bias map, where each of these distant objects has been discoverable, and then do the statistics of asking, what are the chances that we would be seeing this pattern of clustering that is as good as what we see uh, by accident, right? By just, by just these observational biases. And the answer is not zero, it is 0.4%, okay? So there's a 0.4% chance that everything I'm talking about is, um, you know, is false, right? But 0.4% is, uh, is a low enough number that even I'm willing to gamble with this. Like if I was on the way to Palomar and like at that casino, what's the name of the casino uh, that, that's the closest one to Palomar? It's, it's the one that Tree always stays at. Um, yeah, I I forget the name. The Paula like, Casino. Which Casino? one? Paula, P A L A. No, no, there's a there's a different one. 
Or maybe it is Paula. Yeah, I don't really, I, I don't frequent casinos very much. So, uh, but what, and and when I do, I, I get pretty crunk. So I, I I don't remember exactly what the name was, but I remember, yeah, like last time I I went to Palomar, we stayed we stayed at the casino, and uh, it was like a completely, you know, it was like the the it was a completely mind boggling of event because like there are no windows right the floor looks kind of confusing you walk around you're like should i go to the like i know that rationally i, I shouldn't do this but like i should i go to the slot machine anyway i digress my point is right if you if you're going to the casino right and uh right the data tells you that yes there is a chance that you will lose your money, but it's 0.4%, like then, then I'm in, which is kind of what, where we are with the, with the selection bias question, right? There is a chance that, that what I'm telling you is not real, but statistically it's highly unlikely. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. Just as, as kind of part of the story, what, what is the maximum aphelion distance one of these objects can have and still have a stable orbit yeah so it's, it's actually not so much the aphelion it's the perihelion that matters more but so for aphelion i think the most distant objects that we have in the sample is uh it's got a semi-major axis of a little bit over 2000 au so it's aphelion because it's eccentricity so close to one right the aphelion is going to be almost 4000 au um, but for stability, okay. well, yeah, it, yeah, it's the perihelion that matters. And we, um, I'll touch on this briefly at the end of the talk when we have, if we have time, but the question of what sets the limit, what sets the critical perihelion distance, how close you can come to Neptune and still be stable is a fascinating chaos theory problem that I spent all of last year working out and we just published it uh, late, uh, late in 21. And yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating story. Um, okay, Thank but you. let's yeah, let's let's move on. So, as I was saying, the false alarm probability mm -hmm. of all this is zero point four percent. And beyond just computing the false alarm probability itself, what you can do is for each object, you can make a map of where it should have been discovered, where it was most likely to be discovered by observational bias versus where it should be if planet nine is there. And this is a, a plot of this. This is taken from a paper that we published last year, a distinct one from what I was just talking about, the one that Mike led. And I really like this plot because here for all of these objects, what you see is as a function of semi-major axis, right? How large the orbit is proxy for the orbital period. You can see on the y-axis, the offset in a longitude of perihelion, basically offset in where the orbit is pointing relative to planet nine. And if planet nine is there, then sh they should all cluster where this background red coloring is. And this red coloring is an, um, a synthesis of a large number of numerical simulations. But as you can see, each object also has a band associated with it that is colored kind of um, you know, various shades of blue. And the shades of blue tell you the probability that they would be discovered, this object would be discovered in this part of the uh, sky if it was just selection bias. So by looking at this, like, you don't really have to do sophisticated statistics to just convince yourself that what you're seeing, right, where the objects really are appearing is a union of observational bias where they are discoverable and where the planet nine model predicts them to be and you the fact that also you don't really see any objects between 270 and 360 degrees even though there's plenty of observable space there is also pretty telling so uh you know to i guess keep the theme of the last, the latter half of the last decade and some of this decade going, you know, the like observational 
biased story is is basically fake fake news. It's it's sort of like it's it's alternative fact. That's what it is. Um, okay, so now I want to bring it back just a little bit and uh, draw your attention to that weird object in the simulation that was coming out of the plane of the solar system. Remember, I asked you guys to keep in memory that at the end of the numerical simulation, which I just showed a few slides ago, right, where the orb, all the orbits at the end clustered together, there was this weird one object that was coming out and was like, looked like it was perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. So even back a few years ago, when we didn't really know what we were doing, um, or, or at least didn't know it, what we were doing as well as we know now, I guess the proper way to say it is now we don't know what we're doing less than we don't know what we were doing back then. Anyway, um, uh, this object, right, and others like it that appear in the simulation really bothered us. We said, okay, if the model is predicting the existence of things that don't lie in the plane of the solar system, right, that's an important Right, that's an important piece of information. That means that if Planet Nine is really there, such objects should exist. Okay, now people tend to not look for small bodies outside of the plane of the solar system. So we thought, all right, well, maybe we'll, you know, this is a nice uh, prediction. But then, uh, turns out you didn't have to predict them because they had already, they were ex already existed uh, in the WISE data set. So when we looked through the WISE uh, data set, what we found is that the WISE survey had actually discovered a few of these objects that are coming out of the plane of the solar system. So this prediction of the model kind of immediately came true. And, uh, and that's a pretty, that's a, this is actually one of my favorite lines of evidence for the existence of planet nine, right? We didn't, and nobody cared to look for objects that are orbiting the sun you know, at almost a 90 degree angle uh, to, to the plane of the solar system. Um, but turns out they exist and they are a natural consequence of planet nine's um, gravity. Um, we took some time to actually figure out how that works, how they, what the dynamical cycle is that puts these objects there. Uh, I don't think I, I wanna spend any time talking about it other than to mention a discovery made by Juliet Becker, who was a former student of mine, now is once again a postdoc uh, of mine, but while she was a PhD candidate, she found uh, one of these objects, right, as it was transiting from the primary cluster of distant orbits and joining the large, um, large inclination population. So, so she's uh, kind of, well, really, I think, you know, uh, played a definitive role in in uh, mapping out this high inclination population of bodies. Okay, now there's another thing that this high inclination population of bodies does, and and that is it pollutes the solar system. Um, so uh, back, I guess this is 2017 or so, uh, there was a weird discovery of an object which was orbiting the solar system, you know, perpendicularly, but it was not distant, right? And in fact, it was parked right next to Neptune. And that really caught our attention because this, we thought, okay, this is not something that are, comes out in our simulations naturally. All of these distant things that are highly inclined, just like the distant KBOs, all typically have periods of order 10,000 years. This was an object that had a period of like 170 years. So what's going on there? Well, when we looked closer, turned out uh, that we reproduced them too. We just didn't notice initially. So again, this is a output of one of our, uh, one of our simulations, right? We have uh, Uranus, Neptune, the big, you know, purple orbit is the orbit of planet nine on, or one, one variant of planet nine. And what you're seeing, this gold ring is one test particle, one sy synthetic Kuiper belt object dancing around 
in the solar system over its lifetime. Now, what happens is when they hug Neptune, right, they can actually almost always get scattered out, but a fraction of the time they actually get scattered in. And gravity of Neptune does the reverse and circularizes these objects. So this is the outcome of, again, one of our simulations. And it turns out we populate, we create a whole population of highly inclined, what are called centaurs, right? Centaurs are bodies that are, um, that basically the giant planets are playing gravitational uh, soccer with. And when we look at where planet nine uh, puts them, which is the background green color in this 2D histogram and where the discoveries are, which are these blue dots, it's, it's pretty, um, I think it's pretty telling that the, the discoveries are basically where the models predict them to be. Moreover, there's no other physical way to get them there. When things form in the solar system, they form in a pancake, right? The solar system starts out as a disk. You do not naturally produce things that are 90 degrees inclined with respect to the plane of the solar system. So you need uh, the existence of something other than the planets that we see today. Um, so this is, again, I really like this aspect of the whole Planet Nine story because it's kind of weird, right? Like you don't, you know, it's completely different from where we started. We started with this clustered, you know, population of bodies that are more or less in the plane of the solar system and ended up following the trail down to this whole other distinct population of, of remarkable objects, which will eventually become comets. Right. The terminal state of these things is they become Jupiter family comets. Um, OK, so given everything I've told you, right, it looks like I'm, I maybe tricked you into thinking like we know more than we know, right, because we, there are all these different lines of evidence for the existence of planet nine, et cetera, et cetera. We can compute its orbit with pretty good um, precision to, uh, given the data set that we have today. Uh, so like, what's the problem, right? Why don't we just go find it, right? Um, and there's a, there's this exists a distinct Institute of Technology on the East, East Coast, which is not as good as the one on the West Coast, but, but the, the publication from there uh, had a, um, you know, I, I think a good summary which um, which says that given the level, level of detail, it's easy to imagine that we can just point to an area of night sky and say, look there, but this is not so. And the reason that we can't do that is that even though we can figure out the orbit and the mass, we have no idea where planet nine is on its orbit. And the reason for that, so we all we, can input into the model are the orbits of the distant Kuiper Belt objects. We haven't seen them go around their full, you know, 10,000 year orbital cycle. So all we have are their orbits. So all we can deduce from this are, again, the, uh, the predicted orbits of planet nine. So this, is, this means that we have to not just you know choose a spot on the night sky and point the telescope there and look for it it's a whole swath of um of the sky and we've been doing that but turns out observing is really hard see i'm a simple theorist so i used to like you know have this attitude like come on like just go find more objects right like it's the observer's job to go and find stuff but uh, as I started doing observations together with, with Mike and in the search, I realized that it's not so trivial, actually, because, uh, you know, clouds get in the way, and uh, so does the upper atmospheric turbulence, oh, all kinds of stuff goes wrong, right, fog rolls in, uh, and also just like planet nine is super dim, it's like magnitude 24, so it's the, the limit of what Subaru, the Subaru telescope can do. And it's real, um, it's real rough. Uh, the, the search is, is not a straightforward search at all. Now, uh, there are constraints for the, the Planet Nine existence that come, out, come to us not only from directly looking for it, but there is uh, also gravitational constraints that you can ask given the spacecraft trajectories that we've measured 
like Cassini is a great example. Cassini orbited Saturn for a long time. We have great telemetry of Cassini, right? This, uh, could you look for the existence of Planet Nine's gravity in spacecraft trajectories? And the answer is almost. You can definitely say that if you put Planet Nine too close to the sun, you will violate a, you know, the trajectories, uh, the telemetry data that we have. Uh, it's much more difficult to actually find Planet Nine using this way. There are regions of the sky where the residuals become better with Planet Nine, but, but it's not a very significant improvement. So, so um, there are, we can make some bets on gravity, but it's, it's not, it has thus far not panned out into a full-fledged detection. Um, how are we doing on time, Stephen? Um, fine. I, I, as, yeah, of course, I'm concerned we have plenty of time as long as, long as you'd like to uh, okay. stay with it. All right. So if you guys don't mind, I'll tell you guys a brief additional story about Planet Nine, which, I, which is kind of the most recent thing that we've been working on. Um, and, uh, and I'm really excited about this because it's, uh, it's going to somewhat revise everything uh, I just told you in terms of the, the planetary parameters. We just don't, don't yet know how. And that's, of course, the most exciting you know, portion of every project where you know that the answer is going to change, but it's really hard to calculate. So here's what we realized during the pandemic, you know, with like, you know, some children jumping on my, my, you know, face and like, you know, spilling water on me and stuff. I was like, wait, oh. the solar system is not the only object in the universe, right? Like with all of these calculations that I had shown you, right? They put the sun at the center. They draw a box of about mm. 20,000 AU uh, around the solar system. And they you say, all right, go now let planet nine and the gravity of the giant planets shape the distant solar system and see what comes out. But that's not at all how the solar system formed. The solar system formed in a cluster of about 2000 other stars. Okay. And it looked kind of like this. This is a picture of the Orion Nebula, but it's a close approximation and that's the closest star formation region that we know of now the sun only lived in the cluster for the first maybe 10 at most 100 million years but turns out that's enough to play an important role why the reason is that in addition to the kuiper belt you you inevitably form yet another more distant population of icy debris called the inner Oort cloud. Okay. So here's how this happens, right? You've got Jupiter and Saturn, right? The big guys of the solar system forming, right? During the first few million years of the solar system's lifetime. And as they're forming, of course, inevitably, they're scattering out icy debris, just like Neptune is doing, right? And if you ignore the existence of this, the birth cluster of stars, then these things just scatter out and they're gone from the solar system and, you're, and it's over. But if you have passing stars, the passing stars can perturb them along the way. So the way to imagine this is you've got the orbit of, say, Saturn, an object which is getting perturbed, its orbit is growing, it's kind of diffusing outwards, and then it grows large enough that passing stars, which are much closer right to the sun in the cluster can give it just a brief kick right at aphelion at further at a point uh where it's furthest and then it detaches from saturn and then it kind of forms this quasi spherical population of debris at distances on the order of thousands of astronomical units because this is no longer hundreds. This is even further than planet nine. So we didn't come up with this, right? The existence of the inner Oort cloud is not something that's contested. Like everybody agrees that it should be there, right? Nobody has seen it, but you can't avoid its existence if the solar system formed in a cluster, and it did, right? It, it did. We see meteoritic evidence in aluminum 26 that the solar system was formed in a cluster. And 
that Ju Jupiter and Saturn also exist. We know both of those things also are there. So they like inescapable consequence of these two things, Jupiter and Saturn forming while the sun was in its birth cluster is the creation of the inner Oort cloud. So we ask this following question, if this inner Oort cloud exists, right? And planet nine exists, what happens then, right? Can planet nine actually, rather than clustering the objects that Neptune is scattering out, can it actually begin to re-inject some of the inner Oort cloud back into the Kuiper belt? And in any case, what we in interpret as the Kuiper belt, is it, if we go distant enough, is it still the Kuiper belt or are we starting to see the inner edge of the inner Oort cloud, right? And what would be like, will we see the same pattern of clustering? All of these questions we asked ourselves. Now, these are more difficult calculations to do than what I've been showing you because you have to for first simulate the, the, the star cluster and like, I didn't know anything about star clusters until last year. So I like, had to figure out all that and write the code to simulate these and create the inner Oort cloud and then simulate the long-term dynamics uh, subject to both you know, planet nine as well as the galactic tide and all this stuff. But turns out it works, okay? Turns out what the planet nine does exactly what, you, what I just said you would expect it to do. If planet nine is there, what it'll do is it'll take these frozen super long period orbits and re-inject them back into the solar system. So what the kind of what we might be looking at is, especially for these very distant bodies, is the hint of not objects being scattered out by Neptune, but objects that have been sitting at a few thousand AU okay that had been scattered out by jupiter and saturn when they were just forming and perturbed by passing stars and being re-injected and the pattern is the same okay they showed exactly the same type of clustering but the details are different okay so in fact the cluster turns out to be somewhat wider for these re-injected bodies so now we have to go through the process of redoing the parameter estimation of planet nine and that's tough okay because as i said these are difficult calculations that's why we haven't finished them yet it's just computationally a lot more difficult but we're making good progress and we're um collaborating with with some people um they're out in boulder that, that are kind of uh that are great at, at doing the cluster simulation so this is a really fun kind of um you know, not yet an answer, but but halfway to an answer update of, of what we're, we've been up to in the last um, couple of years. Um, and the, I guess the um, the thing here that you can see is just if you look at the pro uh, probability density function of the clustering, right? Things that are injected from the inner Oort cloud, which are the the various multicolored lines, you can see are much more haphazard, even though there's a there's clearly a peak close to 180 degrees there it's a much more uh dirty distribution so um the devil is almost always in, in the details and these details are are you know adding a whole new dimension to the search for planet nine and likely will demand that we update all our numbers by sort of a factor of two um but that's that's part of the that's part of the game Okay, I think at this point, I'll, um, I'll stop. I'll just sort of summarize what the lines of evidence and the caveats are. So why do we think planet nine is there? Well, first of all, the distant orbits all point in the same direction. Number two, they're all tilted in the same way, right? There is an existence of this population of high, highly inclined distant you know, orbits, which the model predicts and finally there is a consequence of this existence which is the pollution of the solar system with these retrograde centaurs that will eventually become Jupiter family comets. Uh, as I mentioned there are a couple caveats all of the <clears throat> parameter estimation that we've done to date assumes that the Kuiper belt fell formed like the Kuiper belt and uh, and that the solar system really 
did not strongly interact with its birth environment, but uh, our new calculations show that this very much might not be true. And if the data is indeed contaminated by the inner Oort cloud objects, then the orbit of planet nine is likely to be more eccentric and somewhat more distant. So uh, for, that's bad news for the observational search because that means it's even harder to find. But um, okay. So I hope uh, I hope that uh, you know this this clears up some of the uh, some of the recent developments on on the Planet Nine front. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well, Professor Badigan, thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. What a wonderful explanation. And if I could start off with a question. All right. There was a, I ran into a, a YouTube video. <clears throat> Uh -huh. You and uh, Professor Brown were discussing the sun, and the sun is tilted at an angle of six degrees with respect oh. to the plane of the solar system. Um, and you were suggesting that planet nine could account for this tilt. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is something that we uh, we actually published uh, back in 2016. This was a paper by my former graduate student, Elizabeth uh, Bailey, and that she led. And the idea was, okay, if planet nine is tilted, right, if its orbit is tilted, mm -hmm. then of course it exerts kind of a torque on the plane of the solar system. And so you could ask the question, given the you know, allowable parameters of planet nine, could this be the answer for why the sun appears tilted by six degrees with respect to the disk of the solar system? Could it be because this over four and a half billion years, planet nine just tilted the entire thing by the entire the orbital plane of the solar system by six degrees? Now, back then, um, you know, our errors on planet nine's orbital parameters were much bigger. And we, we said, yeah, if you kind of go to the higher mass part of what's allowable, the answer is yes, you can. Okay, you can naturally explain it. Now, in our more recent calculations, uh, as we kind of uh, zoomed in on what we think is the more correct uh, set of orbital parameters for planet nine, which is a somewhat smaller orbit, right? And, and mass, which is, you know, six earth masses, not 18. The, this tilt story becomes more and more difficult. So it, we do the calculation, the tilt goes down to something like a quarter of a degree. So it's an effect, but it cannot explain the full uh, obliquity of the sun. Now, uh, does this mean the story is completely dead? Maybe. Uh, meaning for the for the obliquity. Uh, as I said, we're going to be updating the parameters of Planet Nine again, and we'll see where that goes. But that was something that was like a cool, neat calculation that we, we could almost do back in uh, 2016. But I, I think it's not, um, that part of the story is probably going to go away, and it already has uh, to an extent. This is not a problem. There, There's a infinite number of ways to tilt the sun uh, by six degrees, right? One of them, by the way, is to have the solar system start out with a binary companion, right? Most sun-like stars form with, uh, as binaries. And, and so that's perfectly okay. We just thought, wouldn't it be cool if planet nine was the answer? Uh, but I, unfortunately, I don't think that it is. Well, th thank you for that explanation. Are there other questions? Everybody, you I can... have a question. Mike, um, please. Is, are these calculations done basically with Newtonian mechanics and what makes them hard is just the fact that it's a many body problem? Um, right, so the, the these are done with uh, the Hamiltonian kind of variant of Newtonian mechanics. So, uh, but fundamentally, yeah, it's just Newtonian gravity. The thing that makes the cluster calculation more difficult is that there it's not just a, calcula a calculation of uh, of gravity you also have gas 
and the potential uh, of the gas and and you have to also figure out how the gas goes away and how the cluster disperses so you have to like do the full uh, calculation of cluster evolution uh, as an exterior as kind of an exterior boundary condition to the solar system evolution calculation but fundamentally the solar system evolution uh calculations are uh just you know are fun are just gravity and uh you know there's a whole science to how to integrating you know conservative uh, hamiltonians uh but we've gotten pretty good at that so i think that part is not so much a problem it's the, it's the cluster uh part of the evolution that takes a lot more time and remember of course the all these gravitational and dynamics problems are chaotic so you never get away with doing it once right in order to build up a statistical sample right you you bury them and, and kind of it's it's a lot like weather prediction where you kind of uh you know have to do it in this way. i also clicked on the chat button and i noticed that curtis said pachanga and pachanga is the one i was thinking of that's the that's the uh uh that's the casino i had in mind sorry to this is a yeah this yeah okay let, let me ask a question i'm sure that your models give you probabilities of the location of planet nine and you must have an idea of the most optimum detection envelope yep and with that optimism, when would would be we likely to find it? Uh, so it depends on how much optimism you inject into your probability uh, uh, calculation. What, what your optimism prior is? Now, if your optimism prior is high, and optimism prior uh, actually translates here to an assumption of yeah. the envelope. Okay, like what? does planet nine have a hydrogen helium atmosphere if yes it's much easier to detect oh, sure. no. but let's imagine that it does it's it, there's no good reason to suspect it wouldn't actually right it formed probably in the same way that uranus and neptune formed so why not um i apologize for the uh for the siren here um so if you're optimistic then within this decade and that optimism is, and that kind of optimism is in part driven by the um, fact that the Vera Rubin Observatory is coming online, you know, this year, I think, right, literally end mm -hmm. of 22, right, this first light. And um, the thing that Vera Rubin is going to be good at, which we are not good at, is conducting a very efficient survey. See, we've been you know, over the last five years using Subaru to look for Planet Nine, you know, by like, you know, going to Hawaii, right, opening up the dome, looking, taking data, uh, right, very traditional type of astronomy. What we're finding is that these searches are only at most seventy-five percent efficient, right? Mm -hmm. So when we do injection recovery. Uh, with the data that we have, there's a 25% chance that we could have been staring directly at planet nine and I just didn't find it, right? And we, we try to do our best we, the, the, to make sure that we don't, things don't fall into chip gaps and all that, but it's, it's tough. And as you go to the deeper kind of more, um, more dim part of the spectrum, right? That, detection efficiency drops to 50%, right? And then by the time you're at 24 and a half in terms of magnitude, you're at sort of 30% efficient. Now, Vera Rubin is not gonna have this problem because Vera Rubin wakes up every night and just does this all night, you know, over and over and over again, right? So the, the, the efficiency of that survey is just much higher. So I'm, I'm very bullish on, on Vera Rubin. At the very least, finding you know a hundred of these distant kbo's that are going to completely constrain the model right so so we'll see i'm, I'm optimistic uh, i should say that this year we will get to uh, you know get to a point where like planet nine will not be a question of well there's 0.4 percent probability of this and that it'll be like no no 
like it's there we just haven't seen it yeah that was going to be my second question if we don't get the holy grail yeah. of planet nine observation what other observations would refine the models to increase the certainty yeah i mean just more of these kuiper belt objects um i would argue that we're already at a point where the the false alarm probability is low but i think that in this decade we'll go to a point where it'll be like you know five six sigma or something like that so at that point right you kind of graduate planet nine into the same category of things as like the higgs boson or dark matter right you just you know they're there but you have not directly detected them and um, my hope, of course, is that it'll take much less time than it took to detect the Higgs boson, because that was uh, a large number of, uh, of decades in between. It was a 54, 1954 paper. Um, so yeah, it's going to be way better than that. Um, but it, will, it remains to be determined by what margin. Well, thank you. Are, are there are there other questions? Oh, yeah. So I like one of your slides when you're. It's great, by the way. Thank you um, for the presentation. Uh, one of your slides it talks about stable, metastable, and un, unstable. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. So the based on observations or or no no this is based on long term dynamical evolution so the stable objects are the ones where if you were to just take plop them into an n body integrator or just better yet if you were to just wait for 5 billion years and come back in 5 billion years and ask what has happened to your orbit the answer is, would be absolutely nothing Right, these orbits are stable. They just go around the sun. They slowly percent, but that's about it. The unstable objects, right? If you come back on a time scale of, you know, a hundred million years, will be gone from the solar system. They're so strongly interacting with Neptune that they're just getting ejected. Right, they're on their way out. Uh, and the the metastable things are things that diffuse a little bit, but but the diffusion is so slow that they effectively behave like stable orbits, even though there's some orbital um, diffusion there. Um, and, and that pattern of clustering, right, the, is a really important one, right? It's, it's one that uh, people in the field miss all the time because, you know, you have to keep like two things in mind while looking at the data. You have to look, say data is clustered, but only if the orbits are stable and uh, this seems to this point about orbital stability is consistently missed. But um, again, I digress. The idea here is just truly one of orbital dynamics, like what's going to happen to these objects. The unstable ones are going to be gone in the solar system. And, and when you detected so many different objects, I thought your chart showed objects that were observed. Some were that that was just a simulation not an observation uh which, oh there yeah that one yeah yeah so this isn't this is not a simulation these are observations and these are this is indeed where th this is kind of the full census of what we know of today uh mm -hmm. oops in terms of the distant KBO. Sorry, I, I accidentally made the chat full screen, so I can't look, see what I'm, what oh, I'm. Oh, it looks good now. I, 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 what you're showing, it's great. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so here, the purple orbits, right? This is, again, this is not a simulation. This is really what the KBOs look like. And the, um, the purple orbits are the ones that are, do, that are there. Uh, and are just not going away, right? Whereas the green ones are the unstable ones. So what happens to the green ones actually is um, <clears throat> they, like Planet Nine tries to confine them, but because they chaotically interact with Neptune, Neptune basically messes up that confinement. So it's the, it's the equivalent like, you know, of gravitational chaos acting like noise mm -hmm. in the system. Right, where um, where's planet nine is a signal. So uh, if you lower that gravitational noise, 
you get to see the clustering pattern that Planet Nine is instilling upon the distant population. But it's most clearly seen among the, the purple orbits. And you can see that the, the gray metastable things are kind of in between. There's mm -hmm. one that's sort of orbiting the wrong way, but most of them are, are consistent with the pattern. Kind of close. And, and what characteristic in the observations tells you that it's unstable versus stable? Um, you, it's in the observations, you, it basically it all mostly depends on the perihelion distance. Perihelion. Uh, yeah. Okay. And in fact, I maybe will go as far as, uh, See, like this is where you know things are things are getting real. This is like oh, interesting. April of 1959, but um, you know we did this whole calculation. Uh, I will spend the next 75 minutes discussing each of these uh, <laughs> you know, each of these points. But at the end of the day, uh, I'll just give you the answer, and the answer turns out to be that one. Okay, so this top left equation that we derived, this is a paper that I wrote with my friend David Nisforni from Boulder and my friend Rosemary Mardling from, uh, she's in uh, she's on Australia, mm -hmm. uh, an applied mathematician there. Uh, the equation on the left-hand side for the perihelion, dis the critical perihelion distance tells you if something is stable or not. If you detect an object in perihelion, is basically larger than this, then mm -hmm. you're going to be a stable uh, body. If, it, if it's smaller than this, then you're going to diffuse. And uh, prior to this paper, the way that you would do it is you have to do a numerical and body simulation and just mm -hmm. watch the object. Uh, so we've developed a theory for what's, what's, going, what's going on there. Can you Beautiful. plug in the masses and the, the distances. Okay, I yeah. see. Interesting. Yeah. You know, you know it's real because there's a logarithm involved. Right? Oh. <laughs> 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 <Natural>. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. I, I'll believe you. <laughs> that's that's my um that's my baseline you know, measure of like, if something is for real or not, it's like, is there a, is there a log and is it base E? Because if it's not base E, it, it's clearly wrong. I, I thought you were going to say something about Kepler's law, the fifth half power, but that's not quite right either. So no, the five, so I have a current graduate student named Matthew who's working with me and his, uh, part of his thesis is on generalization of this theory because this theory works well for distant orbits. It actually breaks down for sufficiently close orbits. Mm. So I told him, I was like, look, let's, let's think about how we can, you know, generalize this. And he's doing awesome work where he's figured out all of this stuff about these exponents. So mm. there's these exponents of five halves and such are, somehow related to the Pascal triangle. And he understands oh, how, wow. I, I'm, I don't quite understand how. In fact, I, when, when he first brought this, I was like, yes, the Pascal triangle. I definitely remember what that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, he's been really doing great, uh, great work and, and we've been having a lot of fun uh, figuring this stuff out together. Okay, thank you. So this is your criteria, basically the Q crit with the appropriate variables plugged in, and then you can determine if it's stable, unstable, or, or on the borderline. Okay. That's right. I mean, we check this numerically, right? We we do awesome. we don't just say all right, but this is the this is the kind of quick and dirty. You mm -hmm. know, this is if something if you discover a Kuiper belt object, but you're at a bar, or or you're at the Pachanga. Right, and you don't have uh, quick access to your end body code. Like, how are you going to figure it figure it out? Plug it into here. And completely different, but I read somewhere that sometimes we get uh, small stars coming mm -hmm. close to the yeah to the Oort cloud or something like that. But that happens infrequently. Maybe I don't know, but a scale of hundreds of millions of years. But that would not necessarily lead to stable no situation. no but also that that is 
uh, it's close by, when people say it's close, it's like close by galactic standards and completely not close by any normal standards. So the closest approach is what we're talking about there is like 70,000 AU, something like that. So uh, it's yet another order of magnitude beyond the inner Oort cloud. In fact, there's a, I don't know, I don't know why people uh, choose this notation, but it turns out the inner Oort cloud and the Oort cloud mm -hmm. are two completely unrelated things, right? Okay. <laughs> inner Oort cloud forms through a channel that is distinct from the Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud itself stretches out to, you know, 50,000, almost mm -hmm. 100,000 AU. Um, but that's different from what I, I've talked about. The inner Oort cloud is at like 2,000 AU. So the scales are so distinct that the gravity of these passing stars turns out to not do very much. Not too much, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. The galactic tide actually is important, but we include all that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank well, you all. The computer is showing that it's going to die in just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so... If I just like turn off, right? Uh, don't please don't uh, you know? Don't take it the wrong way. I was well, Prof Professor Badigan, you've been very generous of your time. A wonderful presentation. Um, really, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Stephen. And you know, I'm a I'm a huge fan of Palomar, uh, so I really appreciate you guys uh inviting me out and uh you know hopefully at, as this pandemic hopefully between the ba uh, wave and the zeta variant and whatever other variants that come our way you know at one point we'll uh you know all get to see each other in three dimensions yeah we yes. hope yes. that'd be nice yeah i have one more question before we sign off yeah. The, the problem at hand is explaining the alignment of the orbits of these Kuiper Belt objects. Mm -hmm. You're explaining it with a model that depends on a sort of single object, Planet Nine. Are people looking into the possibility that there might be clumps of dark matter that might explain this orientation? Yeah. So I, mm -hmm. I looked into this uh, and First of all, there are calculations out there on like capture of dark matter particles by the solar system. And um, that turns quantitatively, it does not, if you believe the kind of like vanilla picture of the dark matter, right, that does not work. But, you know, well, who, who knows, right? If dark matter caustics uh, exist, Right and exist at sort of multi-Earth mass scale, that's that's a possibility. So having a you know asymmetric dark matter halo to the solar system would be another way to to begin to explain this. One thing that I like to say is ultimately all we can do is is say that there exists some asymmetry with such tilt and such mass. Right, we don't know if this comes. The source of this gravity is a planet, or a giant burrito, right? That's five Earth masses, or 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 anything, right? So, um, you know, the the whole business of it being a planet only comes from the inference that five Earth mass objects are commonly planets, right? Uh, and really. If you ask most extrasolar planets, what is your mass scale, they will answer few Earth masses, right? This is this turns out to be the dominant outcome. So that that tracks. But must it be a planet? No, it can be a burrito, a dark matter burrito. Okay. You get some indigestion from a burrito like that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like dark matter is weakly interacting, so it might be okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to log off and um, I hope all of you have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 And uh, if I could conclude with a note on next time, we're going to take, take a break. We're going to go.
three weeks because we've got the holidays coming in. And next time the Greenway Talks online will continue on Saturday, April 23rd, when Dr. Michael West, <clears throat> Director of Science at Lowell Observatory, will tell us how ordinary matter and dark matter evolved mm. over billions of years and eventually formed a web that embraces the entire universe. He will talk about the cosmic web in a presentation titled, A Bird's Eye View, The Largest Structures in the Universe. That's on April 23rd. And so again, thank you to Professor Battigan. My thanks as well to all of you for coming, for attending and supporting the Green Way Talks online. With that, I'll close the meeting and we'll see you on April 23rd. Thank you very much. Have a great holiday. Bye-bye, everybody. Ken? I'll do it. <laughs>